or Passover of the Jews from bondage or slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land, the new, the new land promised by God to Israel, which is a preparation for, a symbolic prefiguration of, the creation of the new Israel in the Pascha of the Lord. His Passover in and through death to new life in what? The Paschal mystery. The mystery, hello sisters, welcome. Thank, thank you so much. You. Welcome, thank you. There's chairs in here. There's chairs in here also. So come on in. Welcome. So we're talking about Pascha, which is the Slavonic term for Passover, the symbolic prefigurement of preparation for the Passover of the Lord, who passes over from his death, through his death, to new life in the resurrection. And that is prefigured by the passage, the Passover of ancient Israel, the Jewish people from bondage or slavery in Egypt to the promised land, to new life in the land promised them by Almighty God. On February 10th, Roman Catholics celebrated what? Anybody remember? Easter. <laughs> no, not Easter. Ash Wednesday. <laughs> Ash Wednesday, okay? Everybody got their ashes, right? Yes. Okay. St. John Paul II, who was so close to and indeed venerated your foundress, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, soon to be, congratulations, Saint Teresa on September 4th. Congratulations. She's from Albania, which is a link between Eastern and Western Europe. He and she with him saw a unity of Europe, the unity of East and West, the joining of two lungs together, east and west, two lungs like in a single body. If you only have one lung, you go to jog a little bit, you're out of breath right away. Something's wrong, something's incomplete. The body, the physical, the human body, in order to be full and complete needs both lungs, and so too the body of Christ, which is the church. And so John Paul II, wanted to see East and West together within the church, both lungs breathing together as a full, complete, therefore healthy body. So what part of what that begins with is recognizing the fact that some Catholic Christians didn't get ashes on February 10th. <laughs> 
because they're a different particular church within Catholicism. So we are the Russian Byzantine Catholic Church. And so our origins are Russian Orthodoxy. And yet those Orthodox Christians, who at the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the late 19th, early 20th century, sought full communion with Rome, entered into the Catholic Church, were accepted as such by St. Pius X, and he stipulated that they should retain the fullness of their orthodox theological, liturgical, and spiritual traditions. And so we keep the orthodox liturgy. We keep the orthodox liturgical calendar and traditions. We keep orthodox spirituality but in full communion with Rome, because Russia received Christianity before there was a separation of East and West, before there was such a thing as denominational, quote unquote, difference between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And so we attempt to return to that early first millennium, the first thousand years of the history of Christianity, before that separation occurred, where the Slav peoples received Christianity at a time when Rome, the Apostolic See of Rome and the See of Constantinople, which evangelized the Slav peoples, were still in full communion. And so we are a fully, a fully and equal Catholic Church, but we're not Roman. We're in full communion with the Pope of Rome, but we're not Roman or Latin Rite. And so we have a completely different calendar which the popes of Rome themselves have insisted be retained <laughs> to show the universality of the church, the legitimate diversity of the church. That there are more ways than just one, just the Western way of being a Catholic. And so we don't have an Ash Wednesday. We have a different preparation for <coughs> Easter or Pascha, a different Lent which begins at a different time. Now in this year, we are following in this parish, and by the way, we are a parish of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, so we commemorate the Pope of Rome, we commemorate Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione, Archbishop Cordelione and, uh, officially appointed me as pastor of this parish. Um, I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of San Francisco, so we are fully and equally Catholic, but we also use, with Vatican approval, the Orthodox liturgical books. And when I say Vatican approval, again, I mean back to St. Pius X. And we commemorate, in addition to those books, the, the Pope of Rome. Okay? So we are Russian Christianity in full communion with Rome. And so our journey to Pascha, the Slavonic term for Passover, the passage of Christ from death to new life, i.e. Easter, our journey to Easter is going to be different than the Roman Catholic way, but it's still a Catholic way, but it's Byzantine, Russian Byzantine way. And the popes themselves, throughout the centuries, and certainly since the Second Vatican Council, have encouraged Roman Catholics to familiarize themselves with that other way to again learn how to breathe with both lungs, which is to be, oh, healthy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not a bad thing to be healthy. <laughs> so, um, so when did we begin our Lent? I'd like to go through the calendar with you that we use again, along with the Russian Orthodox Christians, including Holy Virgin Russian Orthodox Cathedral, which is just a block and a half away from here. By the way, if you ever want to go in there, and I encourage that, the doors are open on weekdays from morning until 6 p.m. And just go in and look at that beautiful cathedral, those beautiful icons. You'll be welcomed, no problem. And just go in, and, and the Blessed Sacrament is there. They have a valid priesthood, of course, the bishop. And, and, and they're not in communion with Rome, but, but they are magnificent part of the Russian Christian tradition. And you can come in and just make a visit and look at the icons, and it's a beautiful expression of, of ecumenical dialogue and, and a, 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 
the ecumenism of charity, as the recent popes have talked about, just presence, or you know, just just acknowledgement of presence. So we have in the Russian Byzantine Christian tradition three weeks of preparation before we even get actually more than that. Uh, five weeks of preparation before we even get into Lent, properly speaking. So we have three Sundays, in be, uh, prox uh, remote, I should say, preparation, whereby our Sundays are named after the Gospels of that day, of that Sunday. And we have three Sundays where we focus on the fact that Lent can be as I said in my homilies during those weeks, a dangerous time. Dangerous. Anyone's listening is going, what on earth is he talking about? <laughs> what could be dangerous about Lent? What could be dangerous about Lent? What could be dangerous? Well, what could be dangerous about Lent? Anybody else think? Temptation. Oh, could be something else. When I was a kid growing up, Lent was about what you gave up. And it was task oriented. I did a certain number of things and I counted them. And I put them in my dear diary today, I was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up this and this and this, and I did this and this and this and this. Pat myself on the back. Is that a danger? No. Is that a spiritual danger? Yes. Oh, what's the danger? Pride. pride. Spiritual pride. <laughs> and so, the, right before we've even begun Lent, the Byzantine Church introduces us to three <clears throat> events in the Gospels that help as an antidote to the possibility of that spiritual pride. The first is a sinner, Zacchaeus. It's called Zacchaeus Sunday. And so it tells us all about Zacchaeus. Is Zacchaeus self-satisfied? Is Zacchaeus righteous? Is Zacchaeus a good guy? <laughs> Does Zacchaeus say, dear diary, I've been wonderful, I've been holy today? No, because Zacchaeus is a crook. <laughs> He's a crook. That's his job, to be a crook. Because he, 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 he collects taxes. And, and he's there to and he's there to take extort money from from his own people. He's he's hired by the Jew, by the Romans to 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 get more than what was deserved. He's also kind of short in stature, so you know he's not up to par with the physical height of men of his day. And so he's got these two things from a secular perspective and a religious, in terms of the, being a crook, going against him. And yet both of those things work together. Why? Something about him is, is curious about Jesus. He climbs the tree because he's not high enough, tall enough, like I mean, anybody else. He climbs the tree because he just wants to see Jesus passing by. Something draws him to the Lord. And the Lord is walking by. And there are lots of other people there who are really righteous and very tall. <laughs> <laughs> And does Jesus stop to notice them? No. What does he notice? Zacchaeus, the crook and the misfit. <laughs> the person who shouldn't be noticed by our righteous standards. The person who needs Jesus and who is interested enough to seek him out, enough at least to climb a tree, <laughs> to see him as he's passing by. And the Lord says to Zacchaeus, come down, Zacchaeus. Me? <laughs> yes, you, you, up in the tree, you. I must eat in your house today. And what is, what is he saying there? It's symbolic. It's more than just, I'd like lunch today in your house. <laughs> no, he's saying, I want to enter into your house, which means your life, your world. And you're going to feed me, and then I'm going to feed you. And nothing about you will ever be the same again. You'll still be short. <laughs> but you won't be a crook. <laughs> and instantly it happens. Because what does Zacchaeus say? I'm going to pay back everything. Several times over. There's an instant change. Jesus doesn't go to the peripheries to lead people as they are. What, the, what is the point of that? 
He, he goes out to reach out, and his very person and mission changes the people that he encounters and who encounter him. Otherwise, he'd be a fraud because they, they, nothing would happen in their life. When people encounter Jesus, they're healed. If they have physical or spiritual or psychological illnesses, he, he heals these diseases and sicknesses and or, and he, or forgives their sins and or once he's done either one or both of those things, what do they want to do? Follow him. <laughs> they become disciples. How could I ever go back to life the way it was before? I found the meaning of life. I found life itself, capital L. And so Zacchaeus is transformed. Not because he was righteous to begin with, because he wasn't. And the Lord sought him out and changed him, healed him, enlightened him, and transformed him. The next Sunday we have, Sunday is here, okay, after Zacchaeus Sunday, which was February 14th. We have on February 21st, the Sunday of the publican and the Pharisee. And here it's even more striking because we've got the contrast between the two. The Pharisee is a righteous person. He really is. He's doing all the right things. He's keeping all the commandments. He's following the law. There's no doubt about it. No question about it. And the publican isn't. <laughs> There's no question about that either. But the Pharisee, if you read the Gospel text, and it's the Gospel of Luke, 18, 10 to 14, the Pharisee begins to say these words, to talk to who? God? No, reread the text. He's not talking to God. He says these words to himself. Talking to himself. Self absorption. He's talking about how wonderful I am. Dear diary, I did all these wonderful things. I'm so wonderful. I really am. Isn't that great? I feel so good. Oh, and thank God I'm not like this person next to me. <laughs> you know, this, this, this public. You know, what a scumbag he is. <laughs> And the, and, and, and the publican dares not even raise his eyes. He simply says, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. Wow. Who leaves the temple justified? Justified. Not by his own merits, not by his own accomplishments, but by the grace and the mercy of God. The publican. I mentioned today in the homily this morning in case, you know, sometimes we need to, to, to see a movie more than once. Mm -hmm. You were right with me, I guess, in, 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 the, in the homily. You know, some people see movies four or five times, and each time you see it, and you think, I didn't notice that the first time. I didn't notice that the third time. The fifth time, you finally get it. The Lord gives us these gospels again and again and again and again, like another movie, another movie, another movie. When will we finally get it? Okay, so we get the next movie the following week which is February 28th, and that's the Sunday of the prodigal son. We haven't even begun Lent yet, Byzantine Christianity. Three, three movies in a row. <laughs> three Gospels in a row. The prodigal son. And again, there's a contrast between the two. The older son, who's never disobeyed any, any you know, directive of his father and whatnot, but he's so angry that the younger son, who's squandered his inheritance. First of all, he asked for it before his father is dead, then he squanders it, and then wants to come back. And that the father, in his, in his prodigality, the prodigal father, and his love for the son, even when he's a distance away away, embraces him, runs out and greets him, and slaughters the fattened calf, and puts on the ring and the robe, which is to say, your status is restored, as if it had never been lost. The older son is gone. Dad's got dementia. <laughs> Dad's not just. He's angry. You know, what does he remind you of from the Sunday before? The Pharisee. The 
Pharisee is angry because he's not compared to any sinner. He's comparing himself and saying, thank God I'm not like this person. But in the, in the, in the Sunday of the, uh, of the prodigal son, the older son is forced to confront this relationship because he's coming home and he hears all this music and merriment. There's a party going on. He's not invited. Who's this for? I've never had this happen for me. Oh, it's for your younger brother. My younger brother, that ne'er-do-all, <laughs> that, 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 that scumbag, you got to be kidding. Wow. There's a message to this gospel that is pointing out the potential dangers of Lent to the people who have a propensity, like the Pharisee or the older son, to a self-manufactured righteousness. <laughs> that righteousness can't be self-manufactured if it's self-manufactured, it's a fraud. <laughs> that the only righteousness comes as the free gift of God. The free gift of God. And it comes like a magnet to the people who know inherently, like the publican and like the younger son, I don't deserve it. And so these three Gospels in a row are preparing us then to, to, to avoid the dangers, the, the dangers of what? The danger of spiritual arrogance. Who's the person who most gave in to that danger? Well, what if we can call him a person? He's created oh. and he's an angelic Lucifer. intellect. Hmm? Lucifer. 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 We had it all. Yeah, <laughs> we had it all. His diary was full. <laughs> Lucifer, the angel of light, and fell through spiritual pride. He didn't fall for weakness of human physicality because he didn't have that. It was an intellectual sin because he's a created intellect as an angel. He doesn't have human temptations towards, you know, gluttony or lust or sloth or any of those things. He, 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 his temptation is purely intellectual. Dear diary, I am so wonderful, just like every other day. <laughs> <coughs> See you tomorrow, love, Lucifer. <laughs> okay, so then we go to uh, the Sunday of the Great Judgment. The Sunday of the Great Judgment. Wow, that's powerful. What's that all about? And we hear the gospel which is from Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and he's talking about how did I treat other people? You were sick, I was sick, pardon me, and did you visit me? I was imprisoned, did you help me? I was hungry, did you feed me? I was uh, naked, did you clothe me? Um, I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? And so suddenly it becomes very real. It becomes very real. It's, it's, it's again, the temptation is averted to making of Lent a merely conceptual or privatized matter. That this is all about me celebrating me being so holy, <laughs> even though I haven't touched any human being <laughs> at all. <laughs> People in need. Yeah, who did you visit? Who did you care for? Who did you notice? Who did you smile at? Who did you protect? Who did you care for? So the church, instinctively in her wisdom, as in Christianity, leads us Sunday by Sunday by Sunday, like seeing the movie again and again and again, to the avoidance of the traps of spiritual arrogance, the traps of isolationism, the traps of sin thinking that I merit righteousness. Mm. You know? Then, you really bring it home the following Sunday. It's called Forgiveness Sunday. And on that Sunday, we have Vespers after the Divine Liturgy, and the parish comes together, and the priest bows down on the ground. I have a bad hip, but what the heck, I'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> the priest bows down on the ground in front of the congregation. Full vestments, by the way, and these are not light vestments. Mm 
Forgive me, my brothers and sisters, for any harm or offense I have done to you. When's the last time your local priest did that? <laughs> I mean, we, that's part of our ritual. And then each of the parishioners come and they ask the priest's forgiveness and the, each other's forgiveness. It's a long ceremony, but each person embraces and kisses each other. I forgive you and may God forgive you as well. Forgiveness Sunday. That's the last Sunday, by the way, that we have um, a full meal in the sense that we, the Sunday before we've had meat fair Sunday, so that's the last Sunday we, we have meat until Easter, and then the next Sunday we have cheese, and then after that we abstain from meat and cheese and wine and oil. So it's a long fast. It's like the pre-Vatican II Travis fast. You know? So the early Christians, the visiting Christians, took the fast very, very seriously. And then we have, after that, the first Sunday of Lent. And the focus is on the fast. And it's, it's a focus then that after all of these Sundays, hopefully, we, we, we're, we're, we're avoiding the temptations of the fast. The temptation again towards spiritual arrogance by however subliminal or subconscious. I'm so righteous, though. I'm so proud of myself. I didn't need <laughs> any of those things I was supposed to abstain from. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm so holy. What does that remind me of? The Pharisee in the temple. <laughs> Remember that old movie? <laughs> so, uh, who does that remind me of? The older brother? Remember that old movie? You know, you've seen, you've heard all these gospels to prepare us for what fasting is supposed to be all about. There's a Jesuit priest by the name of uh, Father Terrell. Bars. This was back in the 70s. Okay. He wrote a book called Christotherapy. Because all of this is like um, Orthodox psychotherapy. Lent is actually just spiritual psychotherapy. And what he talked about was mind fasting. and heart feasting. I kind of like that title. What he means by mind is, as he defines it in the book, that within Lucifer that fell, that within, because he's a created in a way, angelic in a way, that within the, the, uh, the Pharisee that fell, that within the older brother that fell. In post-Freudian modern terms, we call it the ego. The ego is, again, a self-manufactured concept. It's artificial. And it's all about me. And it's the illusion. It's based on a lie. It comes from the father of lies. <laughs> which is that I exist independently of anybody else. And I'm better than anybody else, by the way, don't you know? So, take a break. Yeah. Okay, tell me why. He is the angel of light who has the first artificial construct, which is what? It's, it's a grandiose lot. And so, who does he tempt to believe that lie? Adam and Eve. You know? And every temptation, every lie since then is based upon that. Me, 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 more, more. Self promotion, self expansion, self protection. The ego, an artificial construct. construct. And I lose my connectedness with everybody else. 
which is what the gospel of the last judgment is talking about. The person who's completely isolated. What person in prison? I didn't know anyone in prison. Somebody hungry, somebody cold, somebody, somebody uh, homeless, somebody uh, thirsty. I, I don't think I've ever met anybody like that. I was busy taking care of numero uno myself. <laughs> Living hell. The judgment's already there before you die. Okay. So the artificial construct, the ego, is something that needs to be disarmed. I won't say destroyed, because sometimes we can do damage to our psyche by a premature and ego-based asceticism. It's a paradox. I'm going to be saint. I'm going to become a saint tomorrow, and then they get frustrated and so angry with themselves when they fall under or have or have some weakness. I'm so angry at myself. <laughs> I didn't do what I said I was going to do. Well, really, are you are you upset that you offended God, or are you upset that you did or that you were against your your spiritual ego, <laughs> your spiritual narcissistic self? <laughs> So ego, or mind feasting, or fasting, pardon me, is a way of fasting from myself and my ego needs, my ego projections, my ego agendas, me, me, more. Bette Midler, I don't know if everybody's heard of Bette Midler, she was a comedian in the 70s and 80s, and, and she used to have a comedy routine where she would say, when I was a little girl, the first words out of my mouth were not mommy and daddy, they were me and more. <laughs> <laughs> That's the artificial construct I'm talking about. <laughs> me, me, more. I need to fast from that before I fast from, from meat and from, and from uh, wine and from cheese. Otherwise, my fasting for meat and cheese and oil and wine becomes another task I've successfully accomplished. Thank you so much, like the Pharisees. I thank you, Lord, that I follow all the rules and laws, and, and I'm so wonderful, not like this scumbag next to me, the, the, the publican. <laughs> <laughs> and does he leave righteous? Does he leave justified? No, he leaves empty. It's, it's the publican who leaves justified. It's the publican who receives grace in the end. So we have all of these gospel texts reminding, them, reminding us of what, what, what fasting really means. It's mind or ego fasting that leads them to heart feasting. The heart, the heart becomes the center of my life in a spiritual context which is not just emotion or sentiment, but that inner core of my innermost being whereby I have a relationship with something and someone other than just myself. And that something or someone is God, is God. When we look at the calendar then, we come to Wow, let's go up to tomorrow. April 3rd already, can you believe it? Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, all of a sudden we're talking about the veneration of the precious cross. Let's look at the cross as that which helps me in my ego fasting and heart feasting. Because when I look at the cross, I'm suddenly forced to make decisions and to transcend myself as the primary category of my life. The definition of holiness, somebody who said, is the, is, the, is, the, um, is the transference, the radical transference of my center of interest from myself to God. Wow. The transference of my center of interest from myself to God. A lifetime journey. And that's the journey to Pascha. That's the Lenten journey. And what helps us with that? What helps us accelerate our progress? What's the cross? What do we see revealed or manifested in the cross? 
Father Alexander Schleiman, an Orthodox uh, liturgist and theologian, wrote a book about this. He wrote a book about this in which he talked about the three stages or phases of contemplation of the mystery of the cross. What is the cross? The cross is the rejection of God by the world, the world created by God. It's the rejection of God. Look at all the sins in the world. Look at all the abortions. Look at all the murders. Look at all the senseless slaughter of terrorism. Look at all the hunger and poverty. Look at all the abuse of, of, of young people. Look at all the abuse of the environment, the world around us. Look at every tragedy, every sickness, every everything that could go wrong. Let's gather all of that up together. All of those sins, all of those evils, from the very beginning to now, and yet to be, and put them against this. And they're a drop in the ocean. What is the worst murder? What is the worst catastrophe that has or ever could happen? The cross. The cross. The cross. It is the world's rejection. It is the world's rejection of. Hello? <laughs> it's my fault. It is the world's rejection of its own creator. How is that rejection revealed or manifested? by the crucifixion of the Son of God. And so the worst thing that could possibly happen has already happened. The worst sin that is the accumulation of all sins has already happened in the mystery of the cross. And so the journey to Pascha is the journey to understanding the mystery of the cross, which I don't understand by taking a theology course but by contemplation of its reality, its inner reality. Okay. And so I see the world saying, like Bette Midler, me, me, more. <laughs> and rejecting all of those gospel stories that we were talking about, Zacchaeus and the publican and the, and the prodigal son, etc. And so the world says no to God, to the truth of God, to the light of God, to the love of God, to the commandments of God, the law and life of God in the mystery of the cross. And as such, it reveals itself for what it is, ruled by its own prince, the prince of this world, who is the Lord himself says, the prince of this world. Now is your hour come. And so the cross shows us the world's rejection of its creator. That's what the cross is all about. If you don't see this instinctively, why do people shrink away? Oh, put that away, you know? It's like, it's like this reminder of what we've done, of who we are. It reveals, it manifests the inner reality of evil, of this artificial construct called the ego that I was talking about earlier. The world created by God is not the ego. The world created by God is just the world created by God. The world rejecting God becomes this world, my world, separate from God. It becomes a separate entity. And it resists communion, meaning relationship, as the gospel of the last judgment shows. I'm not one of those people. I didn't even know they existed. The hungry, the poor, the homeless. Oh, 
I guess it just slipped my attention. I guess it's just all about me. So we create a world about me, which then rejects it's, it's God. Who is God? God is the creator. God is, is the author of life. God is life, capital L. And if the world that rejects life, life itself, what is it left with? Death. If you reject life, what happens? You've condemned yourself to death. And so the second phase of the cross is it reveals condemnation, the world's self-manufactured condemnation of itself to death, spiritual death. Mortality and corruption in Byzantine Christianity are the result of the rejection of God, manifested especially in, his, in the crucifixion of his son. And so the world reveals itself as contra its creator. There's an inner instinctive thing in me and in you and in all of us, we call it original sin and its consequences, that would rather put God on the shelf. Thank you very much. We're religious and devout when it feels good, but if it push comes to shove, thank you very much, I come first. <laughs> And the prodigal son and the publican know this about themselves. And they're saying, God, save me from myself. Save me from myself. And that's where salvation begins. And so the first thing of the cross is rejection, rejection of God. The second thing is that that rejection equals condemnation that if I condemn life itself to death, then I bring death upon myself and judgment. And at that point, we could all just despair. <laughs> Thank God for phase three. Phase three is the triumph of the cross, that out of all of this, there is salvation. That if the cross, the crucifixion of the Son of God reveals the world as evil and as condemning itself to death, then it reveals this world as a dead end, quite literally. And the triumph of the cross, paradoxically, is that now, in and through this apparent humiliation and defeat, is the Son of Man glorified. Now is the Son of Man glorified. And so a defeat becomes a triumph. A humiliation becomes glory. And so the cross reveals a world that is incapable of doing anything for itself. How do you tweak death? How do you say, you know, sin and rejection of God, well, we'll just work on that. We'll just make a better world by our own projects and tasks and activities. We'll just talk with each other and we'll commit more government agencies to the task and, and we'll just make a better world. And if it doesn't happen this decade, then it will happen the next decade. And if it doesn't happen this century, <laughs> a lot of activity here. <laughs> if it doesn't happen this century, then it will happen the next, cent next century, and the next century, and the next century, and the next century, and guess what? It's never going to happen. Because the only one that can make it happen is the Lord, the Son of Man on the cross. And so the cross, precisely by, reject by revealing, by manifesting our rejection of God, and our condemnation of ourselves to our own self-manufactured dead end reveals the only way out, which is his salvation. That this death conquers death, which is the result of that rejection of God. That this death brings life. That this death restores a creation that has gone astray. 
that this death means everything. And therefore, we enter into the mystery, the Pascha, the Paschal mystery of passage or Passover, that this becomes the means by which, like ancient Israel, the people of God move out of bondage or slavery into the freedom of a new or promised land. And so we have the mystery of the cross revealed as the central point whereby our fasting, our mind fasting, our ego fasting, and our, and our heart feasting bring us to the reality that this image realizes for us. That this is what it's all about. It's not about me and my self-righteousness and my accomplishments and my tasks and the fact that I've gone 40 days without eating C's candies. <laughs> it's about what the Lord has done. Okay? Crystal therapy. Christ-centered. Then we get to a marvelous focus on a particular saint who is a Byzantine saint. He's, he's, he's in, in the, in the, he died in the mid-14th century, but uh, John Paul II loved him. He called him a Byzantine father, saint and father of the church. Um, <coughs> he's venerated by Byzantine Catholics and Orthodox alike, Gregory Palamas. Gregory Palamas talks about how we enter into this mystery. Because so far, one could get the impression that this has all been done for me. Kind of a Protestant notion, you know, I just say I believe in all this and then I'm instantly magically saved. You know, like instant coffee, just add water. <laughs> <laughs> it's instant, it's magic. <laughs> you know? But what Gregory Palamas reminds us, along with the great Greek and Latin fathers of the church, is that this is about communion. This is about personhood. That God creates us in order that we might become one with God. By uncreated grace, we are called to be, as St. Peter reminds us, participants in, partakers in the divine nature itself. And so if I'm just sitting there looking at redemption as if it's another movie or a football game, what happens in a football game? You sit there and you watch it. You're, you're, a, you're a subjective, I mean, pardon me, you're, you're, you're a, a passive, part of, a passive um, observer, a passive observer of what's, of what's happening. But God calls us to be full and active, conscious participants in the drama itself. Not just watching God be God. Oh, what did you watch today? I saw God be creator, and God be redeemer, and God be sanctifier. And I had a very entertaining time watching all of that happen, and I believe it's all true, and therefore it's all magically going to be appropriated into my life. Could you tell me you could hear him? Thanks, I'm sorry. Grace, by contrast, calls us to be full and active conscious participants, not passive spectators, in the mystery, the drama of creation, redemption, and sanctification. And that happens, again, through God's uncreated grace, that he draws us into himself. He draws us into himself. That as he creates, he calls us to be co-creators. And as we fail in that through Adam and Eve, saying, no, I want to be God, me, me, more, then we have the mystery of redemption. And God calls us to be co-redeemers. And he calls us to be co-sanctifiers by participants in the mystery of sanctification. Fruitful recipients of a grace. It's a hard-won grace because we, we work at it, we say yes to it through our asceticism, but we receive it as a gift. And so the mystery of the cross reveals on, on, the, on the side here, the one who embodies that, the cross of Assisi especially, which is the virgin become church. She is the one who participates in the drama and by so doing undoes what the original Eve does. She, by her obedience, her faith, her humility, participates 
in the obedience and humility and self, um, self-giving, self-emptying love of her son, the Lord, on the cross. Suddenly, it's not just Jesus doing all of this and we just accept it like it comes down, floating down like a silver platter in our lap. No, if there's a bridegroom, there's a bride. And if there's a new Adam, there's a new Eve. Thank you. (laughs) And who is the bride and who is that new Eve? You. You and me. Ecclesia, the the mystery of the church. And so Gregory Palamas reveals, helps us see that we're caught up into the mystery. We don't just passively receive it. We enter into the mystery of the cross. It's a gift to us, but it's a hard-won gift because we say yes to it, like the Virgin Mary said yes to it. And so we actively, fully, consciously participate in uh, the Lord's own ongoing redemptive mystery. Okay? We participate as passion bearers, as co-redeemers, as St. Paul said, in the mystery of the cross. How do we do that? By our own efforts? No, that's the spiritual danger I began talking about. But we do it by grace. We do it by grace. Through, in and through the cross is the mystery of resurrection, the mystery of Easter. It's already there. Resurrection, Easter, is in the cross itself. How do we get there? Through grace. What's a prefigurement of Easter? A sneak preview of it? the transfiguration. Gregory Palamas talks about how the uncreated grace of God leads us into this participation in the triumph of Easter, the victory of light over darkness, the victory of of love over hatred, the victory of goodness over evil, the victory of life over even death itself. What's the sneak preview that Peter, James, and John get up on the mountain? Transfiguration. And how do they participate in in that? Because they're in it. They're not outside of it. They receive a special grace to see the Lord revealed and manifested as he always has been in his divine nature. And they, therefore, by that grace, become partakers or participants in the divine nature itself. No one can ever become God by nature, of course, that's a heresy. But we become participants by God sharing of his nature in us uh, by grace. Participants or partakers in the divine life. What happened at the transfiguration is fully revealed, fully manifested, fully actualized in what happens through this and after this. The resurrection. And so in Byzantine Christianity, we celebrate the Triduum as a whole mystery. It's not like we have, we pretend that we're sorrowful on Good Friday. Remember that as a kid, you know, I'm going to pretend, you know, it helped if it was a bad day. It was a dark, foggy day. You could be depressed. And, you didn't, you didn't. and then, and then it would, that was helpful if Easter Sunday was a bright day. And now we're done with Good Friday and we have resurrection and Easter. In Byzantine Christianity, resurrection is already here. Because remember, this is the triumph. The apparent defeat is the triumph already there. It's already there. Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him through the cross that reveals the dead end of this world that has rejected its God and and yet cannot conquer the author of life because when it kills he who is life itself, it's defeated. (laughs) That, That whole evil is defeated. Because life can't be destroyed. Capital L-I-F-E. And so resurrection is already there, but resurrection isn't just something that happens that we commemorate. Isn't that nice? Easter Sunday, we we remember something that happened 2,000 years ago. No, you're in the drama. The resurrection is about you and your destiny. Not because you're so great but because you're a sinner, and God loves you. I came to save that which was lost, to seek out and save that which was lost. And I'm drawing you into this love. I'm drawing you into this mystery of death and burial that conquers death 
death, trampling down death, and bestowing upon those in the tombs life, new life, life that can never be eradicated. So that all of our sinfulness, all of our mistakes, all of our tragedies, in the end are not the final word. That love, God's love, is the final word in cross and resurrection. And we become full and active, conscious participants in the Pascha, in the passage, the Passover from death and through death into new life of the Lord Jesus. Because by water and the Holy Spirit, we're baptized into his death in order to share fully in his life, in his risen life, risen and glorified, the mystery of the resurrection. On Holy Saturday, we celebrate a time, the burial in the tomb, where we don't just have the churches empty, it's kind of a time out between Good Friday and, and the Easter Vigil. No, it's a great day of liturgical celebration. We believe the Lord descends among the dead. And what does he say to them? Good news. Good news. Your bondage is over. Your self-isolation is over. The dead ends that you've manufactured for yourselves, it's all over. This is the victory. And so the resurrection icon is the risen Lord, as, and, and he is reaching down, and he's lifting up Adam with his right hand. He's lifting up Eve from Hades, the place of, of a perpetual dead end, the me, the me, the more, that is the dead end of life. The ego, it's a self-manufactured construct. He's saying, no, I'm giving you an alternative, the original alternative, life. Not your life, pretending you're God, but my life, the life of God given to you as a gift that in faith and obedience you're supposed to accept with joy and thanksgiving and love. Grace-filled participation in my life. And that's why at Pascha we celebrate then the culmination of something that begins on Good Friday. Already the joyful hallelujahs are there on Great and Holy Friday and, and, and Holy Saturday and come to their culmination at Pascha. But the glorification is already there in the death on the cross of the Lord because the world has been revealed as a dead end and the alternative has been given to us as free gift the alternative of the risen life of the Lord himself. And so we sing, Christos was Christ, say Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And it's a great joyful celebration. It's the feast of feasts, the solemnity of solemnities, not just once a year, but for every day of your life that the Paschal mystery, Pascha, your journey to Easter, your journey to Jerusalem with the Lord, is the story of your life. And it's the movie, if you want to put it that way, that you're invited to celebrate again and again and again until you reach that great and glorious day. Um, Christos vos cresce, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Does this make sense? Or is it been helpful at all? What's that day? <laughs> Any questions? What's that day? April 30th. Yeah. It's not a brief ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> is this been helpful at all? Is this? Okay. Yeah. Very Any yeah. questions? Yes. So, uh, on the... the the dates of the um, and at the are fixed in the liturgy the dates. Yes, yes. We don't have like the Novus Ordo, the ordinary form of the Roman Rite has three cycles now, A, B, and C. We have like the traditional Latin Mass. That there are dates. Uh, you know, each each Sunday is fixed. Mm -hmm. So our Sundays, our gospel readings don't alternate. Uh, over a three-year cycle. and uh, But we follow the Orthodox uh, Byzantine calendar, so our Easter is always on the same day as Orthodox Easter. This year it's five weeks apart, and uh, next year it's actually going to be on the same uh, day. 
which is a nightmare for me because I'm by ritual, I dual rite, so I serve both the Roman and the Russian Byzantine rites of the Catholic Church, <laughs> and uh, it's very, very difficult. So when I have a breather, so uh, I kind of celebrated the Easter vigil last, uh, last weekend, of course, and then last Thursday, I was at the Carmelite Monastery of Crystal Ray that you're familiar with in San Francisco, I'm one of the chaplains. So I, I, I celebrate the Mass, it's still sort of, but mostly in Latin. And I'm celebrating on Thursday morning, Latin, Gregorian chant, beautiful, beautiful lilies and fragrant flowers and hallelujahs. And then the same night, Thursday night or Friday night here, we have what's called the Liturgy of Pre-Sanctified Gifts. Lent, middle of Lent. Tomorrow's that third Sunday of Lent. <laughs> Purple vestments, dark, somber candlelight, penitential songs, penitential readings, 13 prostrations, head to ground, Christmas baking, um, and an hour and a half liturgy that would be the equivalent of Eucharistic Vespers. Um, and Mercy Sunday before that. You know, and, and so you're 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 living in two different worlds. You know what I mean? Um, and so you only do that for pastoral reasons, of course. But um, but you, I, I I try to embody you know again that living of the two lungs. But this is the Easter lung of the church. We are Russian Orthodoxy in full communion with Rome. So we're the Russian Byzantine rite because Russian Christians in communion with Rome were basically smashed to smithereens during the Soviet communist era. Um, they scattered those who could escape the Soviet Union over the years. And um, it was a church of, of immigrants, of refugees, of long-suffering prisoners and slave labor and concentration camps, a church of martyrs. And, um, so there are only 20 parishes left in the world of these Christians. And they're not Ruthenian or Ukrainian, there are much more of those, but Russian Byzantine Rite. So this is a church that has martyrs as our fathers and mothers. This is a church where we're in between two worlds. We're not Russian Orthodox, they consider us schismatic because we're not in communion with the patriarch of Moscow, we're in communion with Rome. We're not Roman Catholic, and so our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters look at us like, you look kind of strange to me. <laughs> Are you real? <laughs> and by the way, I'm not really interested, so good on. <laughs> so we're caught in between these two worlds. That's a very lovely place to be. And it requires a lot of humility <laughs> and a lot of courage. Lowliness, loneliness, humility, courage. What does it remind you of? <laughs> the cross. This is the church where Pascha reveals the resurrection through the cross. Pascha is that bright, luminous triumph of new life. That the last word is God's word. It's not the world's rejection of its God. That's not the last word, even when there are times when we think it is the last word when we feel an apparent defeat, the humiliation, you know, like the martyrdom of the missionaries of charity recently, you know. <clears throat> That's not the last word. That's not the last word. Pascha, resurrection, in and through the cross, is the last word. And that last word is an eternal word, because it's the word of God. So that's what we celebrate when we say, Christos vos Christe, Christ is risen, risen. Indeed, he is risen. He is risen truly. Risen truly, indeed, he is alive for us. So, hallelujah, amen. On the wages of ages. So, thank you again so much for, for being here. And um, any, any more questions or anything? Was this helpful? Yeah. Um, um, okay, the, the Pascha is on the 30th. Is it going to be? This church? Yeah. I would not, it, can I tell you something? I would recommend, you know, like you don't go, if you haven't run for a while, you don't do the beta breakers, you just run around the block. Yeah, I, I would recommend, because Pasca is all night, I would recommend 
to come for a first Saturday liturgy in the morning, 10 a.m., or a divine liturgy any Sunday at 10 a.m. <clears throat> and those are two hours long. Pascha is very long. It's like from 11 at night until 3.30 or 4 in the morning. Because we combine matins and, and vespers and, and resurrection matins yeah. and processions and then the divine liturgy. It's a very long liturgy. So if you're not used to that, it can be a bit much. But if you want to come any Sunday after resurrection at 10 a.m. here, and then we always have a fellowship meal afterwards. And you're always more and more involved. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sister. So, do you have this that we call it a Holy Week? Yes, we have Holy Week and uh, Great and Holy Week. And then on Thursday, we have the same thing Holy Thursday. We have about five hours of liturgy on Holy Thursday, on Good Friday, and on Holy Saturday. So, I'm doing about three times the hours that a Roman priest would be doing for each, for each of those three days of, of the Triduum. That's why I was saying I'm, 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 I'm always kind of, uh, you know, put on my oxygen mask when those calendars, <laughs> calendars are the same because it's uh, impossible to do. But, uh, but the liturgies here for Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday are very, very long, but they're very beautiful. And people can come to whatever they're able to come to and, and celebrate. And our calendar is on the website for Our Lady of Fatima, Russian Visiting Catholic Church. So, is any of this kind of new or giving you a different kind of perspective, or, or is it helpful uh, to, to hear this uh, reflection on, on Business and Pasta, the journey to Easter? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. You learn something that I didn't have some of the ones that you said. So glad you're here. These are friends that knew me from Redwood City when I was in the oh. hospital chapter for years. And they came up. Thank you so much. Could you share with us your journey? That you're 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 a catechumen, right? So my name's Justin. Uh, I'm a catechumen in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, so we just had Pascha um, last week because we're our calendar is uh, I guess correlated with the Romans. Um, so those five-hour services that, uh, <laughs> that you spoke about, my priest made me come to all of them. <laughs> uh, he also made me go to the great canon of St. Andrew Creek. Oh, yeah, we had that, yeah. We did, did over 200 over. prostrations in two hours. Yeah. I was sore for five days. Yeah. Uh, but, but, my, but basically the catechesis that my priest is making me go through is basically just to go to these services because he says the catechesis at these services the is is the um, is kind of where it's at. So um, yeah, that's sort of where I've been. I've been I've been exploring this for about a year in, in Vancouver. So he's just visiting today. Came to the Divine Liturgy for the first Saturday in our lecture. So yeah, it was fun. Yeah, you know, uh, Dorothy Day was a, uh, a lover of the Russian Byzantine Church. She was a regular parishioner at um, St. Michael's Russian Visiting Catholic Church in New York, and uh, Thomas More, uh, Thomas More, Thomas Merton, before he uh, entered the Trappist Cistercians, was a parishioner at St. Michael's as well, one of our fellow parishes in New York, in the Russian Visiting Rite. It, 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 you, can, you, you notice in the liturgy there's a great emphasis on reverence, on uh, the worship of God, uh, the transcendent dimension, it's, it's anthropocentric, or pardon me, theocentric rather than anthropocentric. So it's not the assembly celebrating itself, you know, here we are. It's, it's really focused on God, the worship of God. Uh, the liturgy is celebrated ad orientum. Uh, we celebrate all of our liturgies in English, but there's a great emphasis on, again, praise, thanksgiving, and worship. Um, we do the cherubic hymn, you know, mm -hmm. again and again, and the Trisekia, mm -hmm. Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us, and make a prostration for that. There, there, there's a great sense of reverence and worship uh, in, in, our, in the focus of our liturgy. And we also use the old command. Yeah. So, but we, our liturgies here are English, mm -hmm. but, um, but we use the Orthodox liturgical books with at, at the addition of the Pope of Rome being commemorated. 
So we're celebrating the same Eucharist with the same books as the people of Lock and Map Way up the street. And we pray that the Lord himself, in the action of his spirit, might do what human beings are capable of doing by themselves, which is uniting and, and, and rediscovering the same one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one spirit of the risen Lord, the risen Christ. So, so our mission is to make ourselves better known to Roman Catholics, especially through this lecture series, that Catholics could see the and, and breathe through the, the other lung of the, of the body so that it might be more healthy and whole, so that our saints, our liturgy, our spirituality enhances the spirituality of those who come from the, from the Roman tradition. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, have Thank to, you. I have to end with one last person who is a great example from the Russian tradition of, uh, of Lent. Uh, in, the in the Russian Christian tradition, there is such a thing as called the fool for Christ, the holy fool. In the Western tradition, the best example of this would be St. Francis, Francis of Assisi. And, um, and I would say that Mother Teresa herself, when she left the Loretto sisters and went off without anything in her pocket, would have been a holy fool. <laughs> um, in other words, someone who has nothing, someone who is countercultural, someone who is not falling back on uh, the financial or the intellectual strengths of people who think that they are somebody special and important because of those strengths. And, um, and, uh, and at that point, you're reduced to total dependence upon God. And, um, and, uh, and, and he reveals himself through the weak and the apparently foolish and, and the powerless of this world. So in the Russian tradition, the fool for Christ is, is a charismatic individual who reminds the wealthy, the powerful, those with status, societal status, um, of that judgment day that we were talking about earlier in one of our gospel preparations for Lent. And one of those people that, 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 that uh, this particular holy fool, St. Basil of Moscow, uh, approached was the Tsar of Moscow. The Tsar of Moscow at that time was a formidable figure called Ivan IV, a.k.a. Ivan the Terrible. Why was he called Ivan the Terrible? Because if you, even a high-ranking diplomat, contradicted him, you would be impaled <laughs> on a stake the next day. He was, he was slaughtered, he, was, he killed his own son. I mean, he was a very bloodthirsty tyrant and very angry all the time. So <clears throat> Basil the Fool, uh, this, this holy man of, of Moscow, who everyone venerated, even, even the Tsar, um, um, was visited by, the Tsar was visited by Basil, and during Great and Holy Lent, which is very strict fast, Basil comes up to the Tsar with this big slab of meat, like a steak, filet mignon, plops it in front of the Tsar. And the Tsar says, I can't eat that. It's Lent. <laughs> I'm fasting. And the holy fool, St. Basil of Moscow, looks at him, the Tsar, right in the face and says, what does it matter if you abstain from the flesh of animals when you destroy the flesh of human beings? If anyone else had said that to Tsar Nick or to Tsar Ivan, Ivan the Terrible, in a split second, that would have been his last remark on earth. Ivan the Fourth began to cry. He began to weep. Because in the Russian tradition, there's this sense that the holy fool has given up everything and is therefore a, a spirit bearer. That somehow in their humility and their affiliation with Christ's humility, Christ's kenosis, Christ's self-emptying love, that there is a receptivity of the Holy Spirit and that one can be a bearer of the Spirit, the grace of God to others. And so Ivan received this from this holy fool and he started crying, he started crying. He said, I need to repent. And when and years later, when Basil of Moscow died a natural death, um, the Tsar, the Tsar himself, shed his re imperial regalia, put on ordinary clothes of mourning, and was a um, was a pallbearer at the funeral of Basil of Moscow, St. Basil. And the great 
St. Basil's in Red Square, Moscow Square, is named after that saint, St. Basil of Moscow, the holy fool. So <clears throat> all of this is like <laughs> God's foolishness, if you will. Our wisdom is, is uh, God's foolishness, and, and our wisdom, Lent is a way of entering into, into the foolishness of God, whereby love uh, conquers hatred through an apparent defeat. And the triumph of Pascha is again that triumph of light over darkness, of holiness over evil, of life even over death itself. In Christos Christ, say Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. So may you have that life in abundance, and thank you again so much for being here, and uh, appreciate it.